All right, the last week, uh, last two weeks, we we're talking about judgment, and I'm going to try to take it from there. Anyway, uh, and bring it into some talk about the um, high priesthood. If you will recall, we talked about the high priesthood in reference to judgment and judgment in the house of God. Um, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We are now at the judgment seat of Christ for those of us in the church. I mean, there is a a, uh, great day of judgment where we'll all appear before Jesus himself and we'll give an account of ourselves. But there is that pattern of judgment and and everything is advanced for us into this life. We're being judged, and that has to do with our sins going on beforehand. We're being judged. We're being cleared. We're we're being cleared before God. And uh, we are also manifesting the righteousness of God to our generation to set up judgment for God. God's going to use us, our life, as much as Christ comes forth in our flesh. We live a a life of sanctification we separate ourselves to get ready for the coming of the lord as i said last week that becomes a spirit of prophecy and it becomes a manifestation to the conscience of men we are helping god to set up judgment the queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment and shall condemn this generation she came from the uttermost parts of the earth you know god's going to raise us up and condemn our generation right because we sanctified ourselves from our worldly ambitions and career goals and everything else when we heard the call of God and we separated ourselves you know that's how it works Um, Paul even talked about the Jews and the Gentiles when the Gentiles who by nature do those things contained in the law shall they not judge you who by letter and circumcision transgress shall they they not judge you shall not their the, 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 the righteous conscience and their respect for the law doing it only out of their conscience because of what they've gleaned out of the sense of righteousness that God put forth in the creation and it it actually reached their conscience shall they not judge you who by letter and circumcision doth transgress all right and then uh, we talked about how the church has a role in judgment them that are without God judges but them that are with within Judgment is given to the church for judgment. The time has come that judgment must first begin at the house of God. So we talked about the high priesthood. And in the Old Testament, that was Aaron. I'm kind of reviewing a few things. The Old Testament, that was Aaron. Aaron was the high priest. And he had a certain garments and stuff that he wore. And I called attention to the the girdle. And upon the girdle, it was attached to the, the breastplate of righteousness or the breastplate of judgment, I should say. Paul talks about the breastplate of righteousness. You might say we're made, we're made into the righteousness of God as God judges us. We are led into the righteousness of God. And then that was Aaron. And then, of course, Jesus became a high priest. But then in Zechariah, we drew attention to uh, Joshua, the high priest, who was clothed in his filthy garments. And so when you look at the attributes of Jesus Christ as a high priest in the book of Hebrews, you know, he was uh, holy, harmless, separate from sinners, higher than the heavens. And you think of high priesthood, you think of uh, uh, in the high priesthood as Jesus as a high priest, you think of purity and cleanness and wholeness. But in Zechariah 3, the high priest is characterized by Joshua, Joshua the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, Satan standing in his right hand to resist him, standing in his, clothed in his filthy garments, but standing before the angel. And that, you know, we pointed out the successor to Moses was Joshua. Moses is a type of Christ, Joshua is a type of the church, and all of that. You know, the successor to uh, Elijah was Elisha, the successor to David was Solomon. There's that pattern. So, uh, this is a type signifying that 
we as the church, as the body of Christ, even though we're in our sinful flesh, our filthy garments, if you will, we still have a legitimate and a legitimate and God approved role to play as high priest, bringing forth judgments in the church, even in our filthy garments. All right, so when we talked about that, uh, Joshua clothed with filthy garments, he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, Take away the filthy garments. And he said unto him, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. We talked about, though we're in our filthy garments, we must change our clothes. We must put on the righteousness of Christ. You know, it has to go past Christ dwelling in our hearts by faith. He has to come out of our hearts, be birthed into, the, into our flesh, and, and <laughs> manifest in our flesh. We have to become the expressed image of God. Or Jesus has to, we have to learn how to yield our members so Jesus expresses himself through our mortal bodies. All right, that, that preserves his glory better if I say it that way. Then no one can say, I'm saying I'm Jesus. I'm not Jesus, but Jesus is being himself in me when I am dead, when I have been judged, when the old man is dead, when my desires for this world are gone, I don't pursue after the things of this life. I dedicate, consecrate, devote myself to yielding my members to the Holy Ghost. And that means Jesus Christ is manifest in our mortal bodies. That is putting on the wedding garment. How did you come in here, he said to the man, not having on a wedding garment? And the man was speechless. So there's a whole lot more to the righteousness of Christ than just simply acknowledging or believing or reading something in a book and simply ascribing it to yourself by virtue of a mental assent because you've somehow acknowledged it. We've gone over and over and over again that this is an operation. This is a cleansing, purging process our whole life long involving affliction, the judgment of God, the acknowledging of the truth, Godly sorrow, letting godly sorrow work in us, embracing this operation, uh, resigning ourselves to the sufferings that are involved, also uh, having confidence that the power of God and the grace of God will sustain us and keep us in confidence, in hope, through all of this hardship, uh, how through much tribulation we enter the kingdom of God, but we have a confidence that we can do this. And the, the, main, the main reason we can do this has everything to do with the high priesthood. Now the high priesthood is, has a breastplate of judgment. He is bearing our judgment upon his heart continually. How can I bring my, my people through judgment so that their sins can go on beforehand? How can I bring them through judgment? How can I bring them through affliction and cleansing and a baptism of fire, a baptism of affliction to purify them and keep them? How can I prepare them so that they can be sons of God? As many as received Him, then He gave the power to become the sons of God. Now the captain of our salvation, Jesus Christ, was not born perfect. He was made perfect. That's why at the birth of Jesus Christ, there's no particular importance. There's no particular attention God put in the scriptures about the day of his birth. You know, the Bible says better is the day of, of your death than the day of your birth. Because a little baby Jesus in the manger isn't any threat to you or, or to me. A little baby Jesus in the manger, he can't save you. He's not going to be able to save you until he grows up and becomes a man. And takes on his apostleship and gets filled with the Holy Ghost after he gets baptized by John the Baptist. And after he goes and learns how to lay down his life and take the sins of the world. Until after he goes and preaches to the spirits in prison. Until afterwards God raises him from the dead and seats him at the right hand of the, of the power on high. And then becomes a, a high priest. And then when he's a high priest he is able to save to the uttermost. It's the completed, made perfect high priest Jesus Christ that's going to save you and judge you. He's going to judge the quick and the dead. He's going to judge us as the, the quickened, righteous people. He's going to judge the dead, people who are dead in their trespasses and sins. So you see the little baby Jesus, without going through all the development and 
everything and finally resurrected, then what, what good is it to us? It's, it's nothing to us. Our, our, the power of salvation is, and the power to be judged so our sins go on beforehand, so we can be made perfect, so we can become sons of God. The power of that salvation is through the high priesthood. That's why we, Jesus says, uh, you know, you eat the flesh and you drink the blood. Uh, he, it, you do show forth the Lord's death till He comes. He says, this do in remembrance of me. You know, that's the only thing in the Bible that God told us to do, to remember Jesus. He didn't say, put a nice 24 karat gold crucifix around your neck you know, you ask people, why do they do that stuff? Why do they wear jewelry like it? Oh, it just helps me to remember. It's in remembrance that Jesus died for me. Well, that's not what Jesus said to do in remembrance of me. He didn't say put on a bumper sticker in your car in remembrance of me. He didn't say any of that. There's only one way God wants us to remember. He wants us to remember by being a partaker of his sufferings, that I may know him and the power of resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto death, even the death of the cross. So this is all wrapped up in high priesthood. We want to really understand high priesthood. High priesthood. Jesus is the high priest in heaven, and as Jesus gives out the Holy Ghost and distributes gifts according to his will, ministering gifts, gifts of helps, gifts of miracles, whatever, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, all those gifts of the Spirit. What are those gifts for? We talked about it in 1 Corinthians uh, 14. Paul outlines that, you know, it, when he deals with the issue of tongues and he says, I would that you prophesy. If you speak the tongues, you're like a barbarian to the unlearned and the unbelievers. But if you all prophesy, preach, speak in English, and the Holy Ghost is upon you, that is the high priest working through the body of Christ to reveal the secrets of the hearts of men. In other words... Judge. Judgment means bring things to light. When you have a judgment, it means you bring things to light. And he, uh, Enoch pointed out a scripture uh, afterwards last week. He shall make his judgment to rest for a light to the people. So when you read in John chapter 3, he, uh, this is the condemnation that men love darkness rather than light and they would not come to the light. You can substitute the word in judgment. They would not come to the judgment. They did not want to be exposed because they love their darkness. When you love your darkness, you protect it. And if you have ignorance and you love your darkness, you don't want to overcome your darkness, you'd rather partake of your darkness, then you protect your ignorance and by not coming to the light. To deceive your own conscience, to think, oh well, I didn't know. But anyway, we have a high priest, and this is uh, the role of the high priest is um, it's, it's all, it's very, very important. It's critical to our salvation. It says, many received them, and then he gave the power to become the sons of God. So, Joshua the high priest, the Lord says to him, If thou wilt walk in my ways, if you'll keep my charge. Oh, yeah, I was, sorry, um, I was talking about taking away the filthy garments. We have to change our clothes. We have to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, put off the old man with his deeds. And put on the... That is what is represents putting on the wedding garment. So, yeah, we, we have to change our clothes here and put on the wedding garment. And that is a whole operation and process. And if... Uh, Zechariah 3, 7, If thou wilt walk in my ways, if thou wilt keep my charts, and thou shalt also judge my house. That's what he says to Joshua, the high priest, clothed in his filthy garments. So here we are. We're going to judge God's house, right? I mean, I'm not going to judge God's house as an individual by my own self-will and by my own carnal perceptions, but just to be advised that as the Holy Spirit moves through the body of Christ and through preaching and revelation and gifts of the Holy Ghost... Things are going to be revealed to, that are necessary for us to go on to perfection. Remember, Jesus was made. The captain of our salvation was made perfect through 
suffering. So he had to learn obedience by the things he suffered. He was not a perfect high priest able to save us as a baby. He was not born into the perfection of his high priesthood. He had to be made perfect. Chiefly because we have to be made perfect. Now how can a high priest be touched by the feeling of our infirmities and how can a high priest relate to us in the weakness and infirmities and temptations of our flesh unless he himself has been partaker of the same? So like the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, for he became us. Now he did just, didn't just come down to meet us or have a conversation with us or to see what was going on. No, he became us. He, there's a profoundness in that. He actually became weak in flesh, able to be tempted. Tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. Now I'm going to bring this into a whole thing of high priesthood, and I don't know how far it will go or what depth it will go, and we'll just do it next week if I don't get time to get through it all, or we'll continue it somehow. But this goes into the whole concept of Melchizedek as a high priest and Jesus as a high priest. Okay, so... You know, uh, where do we start? Well, let's start here. No man hath seen God at any time. You know that scripture in the book of John? No man. That's, that's a fairly absolute statement here. No man, which means no means zero, nothing, nobody. No man has seen God at any time. So in the whole realm of time, nobody ever saw God. Only Jesus, the only begotten of the fa- who is in the bosom of the Father, Jesus has declared him or revealed him or let him become expressed through his flesh. As he said to Philip, you know, show us the Father, sufficeth us, sufficeth us. Have I been so long time with you, Philip, and thou hast not known me? If you see me, you have seen the Father. And here's another critical thing about high priesthood. Seeing that no man has seen God at any time, well, would that include uh, Peter, Paul? Would that include Moses? Would that include Elijah? Would that include all the people of the Old Testament? Would that include Adam and Eve? Are, is Adam a man? Was he created in the realm of time? And the Bible says no man has seen God at any time. So it's referring to God as his existence as an eternal spirit, God. Just God as an eternal entity. Uh, you know, Jesus is the Son of God. God um, God is not a man. God is a spirit. For God is a spirit, but Jesus is a man. But God was in the man, Jesus Christ, reconciling the world to himself. There's three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. The three are one. Now, <laughs> try to get into a depth of something. The Bible says that Jesus is the beginning of the creation of God. Jesus Christ is the beginning of the creation of God. So God, in, before he created anything, you know, I believe he thought it all through. I believe God is the great exactor. He planned it all out from beginning of time to end of time. He figured it all out and he decided he wanted to be glorified and God wanted to glorify himself as a man. And he wanted to reveal himself to man. And he wanted to have fellowship with man and fellowship implies a certain degree of equality which I'm not going to go into right now, but a certain degree of equality, similarity. So that means God had to create man, but if God wanted to have fellowship with man and have worship from man, then, then God himself had to be a man. It has to be man to man. So the first thing God did is he formed himself into the form of a man, Jesus Christ. By him were all things made. Without him was nothing made. Whether they're thrones or powers or principalities or people or angels or animals or humans or whatever. It was all made by Jesus Christ. Thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So then if Adam in the garden has some kind of communion with God and he's talking with God and 
you know, and God talked to Adam in the cool of the day and everything, but then the Bible says no man has seen God at any time. So how does that, how does that work? Well, because what appeared to Adam in creation in the garden was not God the eternal spirit, it was God manifesting himself as a man to Adam, and that man was Melchizedek. In the book of Hebrews, you know what the Bible says about um, Melchizedek. Okay? Melchizedek was without descent. For this Melchizedek, priest of the Most High God. Now, Melchizedek is a high priest, because we'll go on in the book of Psalms. It says about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, for thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And that's signifying an eternal position. All right? Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. To whom also Abraham gave the tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. So Melchizedek is the king of righteousness. He's the king of peace. And Melchizedek has, is without father, he's without mother, he's without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. All right, I mean, just ABC Elementary, who's the only entity you know that has no father or mother, didn't have a beginning, doesn't have an end. This is what the Bible says Melchizedek. These are the characteristics, the attributes of Melchizedek. So obviously then, Melchizedek is God. Only God has no beginning and no end. All right? But now God first formed himself as a man, Jesus Christ, to create all things. Now, uh, so Jesus Christ is God. All right? Jesus Christ has no... Jesus Christ existed before creation, right? Because if you go to John 17, he says, Okay, now, Father, glorify thyself and me. Glorify me with the glory I had with you before the world. So, uh, it is impossible. Okay, let me address a few things. Because... Um, I've had people tell me, this is what got me onto Melchizedek in the first place. So some people tried to say, and some Jewish scholars, I guess, believe this, that the Melchizedek priesthood came from the lineage of Seth. That's what they say. It came from the lineage of Seth. And this is impossible. Uh, the Mormons also claim that they have a representation of the Melchizedek priesthood in their church, which is impossible, because the Melchizedek role of priesthood has now passed away. It's been replaced with the priesthood of Jesus Christ. So, what we're saying is Melchizedek is eternal. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. It is an eternal thing. It's a spiritual thing. So, who is Melchizedek? All right. Hebrews says, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times fat passed unto the fathers, right? hath in these last days, okay, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. That's true. The Son, Jesus Christ, the Son. We're going to find out that Melchizedek was a man. But Melchizedek and Melchizedek was the functioning priesthood that God used in the Old Testament. And he, in the Old Testament, he appeared as a man to men. God, in sundry times, at various times, and in various manners, he spoke in, unto the fathers by the prophets. But God revealed himself to certain people, key figures of the Old Testament, and he appeared to them as a man. And whenever you see in the Old Testament 
God revealing himself to, let's say, Abraham as a man. If you remember that uh, when God said about Sodom and Gomorrah, I'll go down and I'll see whether it's all together according to the cry of it. And, well, God comes down to Abraham in the book of Genesis. He comes to visit Abraham and he has two men with him. Then when you go to the, the situation with Lot... The man wasn't there, just the two, two angels or the two men went to see Lot. But the man there was Melchizedek. The communion and communication that Adam had in the garden was, was, was with Melchizedek. Because no man has seen God, like the purity of just God the Spirit, no man has seen God at any time. In fact, the only way we can behold the glory of God, the only way is only in the face of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ becomes the high priest. He becomes the mediator. He is the only way to God. The only way to God. No man comes to the Father but by me. But by me. But by this administration of the high priesthood. This is the only way you can come to God. You cannot come any other way. There is no... Buddhist or Muslim or it's, it's none of that. Only by Jesus Christ. All right, so Melchizedek, no father, no mother. You see, he, the only the only default identification for Melchizedek is to say that Melchizedek was God as a man, representing himself to man as a man. He was foreshadowing how he would come to man and reconcile him uh, by Jesus Christ. But the fullness of time had not come, so Jesus Christ had not come into the world yet. So in the meantime, there must be, until that time, until the fullness of time, there must be an existing, functioning, high priesthood role to administer the things of God to the people of the Old Testament until Jesus Christ comes. And it can't be God's Spirit directly because no man sees God, sees God at any time. So he had to come in the form of a man. And that's why I'm saying Melchizedek is God appearing in the form of a man to men in the Old Testament as a high priest. Consider how great a man this was. Melchizedek is the revelation, the manifestation of God to men as a man because that's the only way it could be from the beginning of time to the uh, end of time. Everything that we receive from God has to come through a man and it has to be specifically through a priesthood. Melchizedek was a high priest. But there's a difference between Melchizedek and Jesus. Well, if you can receive it, uh, Melchizedek was Jesus Christ before he took on the likeness of sinful flesh. Now, us as people, we can raise up a... Um, let's see. We can, we can raise up issue. We can take up issue with God and say, well, God... You know, you, you know, how can you save us or how can you take issue with us? Because you don't know what it's like to be in sinful flesh because you're just holy and righteous and you're all powerful and you can't be tempted. So how can you understand what we're going through? And you'd almost have a point. So what does God do? Well, that's why I said Jesus Christ, the Bible says, for he became us. He became us. What? He was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. By the grace of God, he tasted death for every man. And he became that way so that he could be in the same form of flesh that we are in, suffer all the temptations that we suffer, and yet be without sin, which now qualifies him to be a faithful and merciful high priest able to bring many sons unto perfection. And make no mistake about it, the name, the end of the goal here is that we must go on to perfection. We have to. We have to go on to perfection. But these are they that bring no fruit unto perfection. perfection. 
The work of the ministry is for what? Big crusades, music ministries, and so on and so forth? No, it's for the perfection. The perfection of who? The saints. So we have to know who the saints are. And it's for the perfection of the saints, right. So, Melchizedek, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God. Okay, now, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, in the fiery furnace. We threw three men in there, but there's a fourth man loose and walking around in there, and his appearance is like unto the Son of God. Melchizedek is made like unto the Son of God. So who was the fourth man in the fire? Melchizedek. Melchizedek. And it wasn't God as some mysterious spirit floating around. It was a man. When Abraham came back from the slaughter of the kings, who met him? A spiritual force? Some voice out of a cloud? No, he was met... By a man, Melchizedek. And this Melchizedek brought forth bread and wine. wine. Body and blood. Remember Jesus, except you eat my flesh, my flesh is the bread. My flesh is the bread. Or the bread is my flesh, one of of the other. And the body and my blood, this is my blood. The life is in the blood. So, When you're talking about priesthoods, high priesthoods, whether it's Melchizedek or Jesus Christ, you're talking about bread and wine, body and blood. We are made the body of Christ, and we are also made to walk in the same life of Christ that he walked. But in the Old Testament, of course, he brought forth bread and wine. Okay, so um, Here's Melchizedek was made like unto the Son of God and he abides a priest continually. So when Jesus was made uh, after the order of Melchizedek, what it means is his priesthood is an eternal one just like Melchizedek's. Well, um, you know, I, I... I preached on this at the farm for a while, way back, quite a few years back. And, you know, Jesus has to be subject to everything we we are subject to, right? So then, did you have to be water baptized? Well, then Jesus had to be water baptized. That's what John says, oh, yeah, I need to be baptized of you, and you want me to baptize you? And Jesus said, suffer to be so to fulfill all righteousness. In the overall plan, I as an individual, if it was just an issue of my status with God and nothing else, I don't need to be baptized. But if it's an issue of all righteousness so that I can go through everything you go through and it's so that if I don't do this, then um, we don't bring many sons unto perfection. You see, it's the overall plan of God, so do it because... To fulfill all righteousness, the grand eternal purpose of God. You know, I have to do this. So he suffered him, of course. So you had to be baptized in water. Jesus had to be baptized in water. And what happened? He came up out of the water and the Spirit descended upon him like a dove. And in another place it said, the Spirit descended upon him in a bodily shape. Guess who that was? Melchizedek. That was Melchizedek now. Melchizedek, who was Jesus Christ before he was in in the likeness of sinful flesh. Now, Melchizedek moves into the body of Christ, which is the likeness of sinful flesh. Melchizedek took up his residence in the body of the flesh body of Jesus Christ. So Jesus, and I like it in the other place in Luke, I think, where it says, and Jesus, being baptized, prayed, and the heavens were open. And that's how it works with us. God baptizes us in affliction. Is any afflicted? Let him pray. pray. You're afflicted, then you pray, because you're humbling yourself under the mighty hand of God. And then 
Heavens are open. You get the Holy Ghost. So Jesus was baptized with John. He prayed. The heavens were open, and Melchizedek descended in a bodily shape and entered into Jesus. So what we're seeing here is that Melchizedek is the high priesthood of Jesus Christ, not made perfect yet. Because did not have the experience of going, of living and relating to the temptations of sinful flesh. And yet there had to be a functional high priesthood before Christ came. And that functioning high priesthood had to come in the form of a man. It had to be a man bringing the things of God to men before Christ came in the flesh because no man has seen God at any time. It has to be given to you through a priesthood. It has to be given to you from a man. So God Himself became the man, formed Himself as a man, and functioned as a high priest. And in various ways He spoke to the fathers in times past. He appeared to Adam in the garden. He was in the, walking around in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. How about Jacob? Jacob, who did Jacob wrestle with? The angel. Well, it wasn't just an angel, was it? It was a man. It was, it was the Lord. And he said, well, tell me what your name is. He says, well, what do you ask me my name for? I can't tell you my name. It wasn't time yet. The revelation of, of Jesus Christ wasn't to, to be there yet. But Jacob wrestled with the angel, and that angel was a man. Touched his thigh, right? I don't know, I have it here somewhere, and maybe I'll... Yeah, here they are. Okay. Acts chapter 7, uh, Stephen says, The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Char Charon. Charon. You think that God of glory was the Spirit of God? No, could not be, because God hath not... Uh, no man seen God, uh, God at any time. So what appeared to Abraham was Melchizedek. And I already mentioned Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Not the Son of God, but like the Son of God. Now when God has a perfected priesthood, and remember, the Melchizedek priesthood in the Old Testament was not a perfect priesthood, but it was a forerunner, a prerequisite till Christ comes. There had to be a, a priesthood, and Melchizedek then had to dwell in the body of Jesus Christ to taste death, to taste temptation. So all of those things could be experienced by a flesh being which was one with the Spirit of God. Right? Because when we talk about high priesthood, it's only by the high priesthood that we're reconciled. He is the mediator. He is the propitiation for our sins. He's our mercy seat. He's the go-between. He's the one that sees God's side of the picture, but he also sees man's side of the picture. He's the only living being perfected priest that can relate to God perfectly, seeing Melchizedek is in him, right? All the glory of God. And relate to man because he was in sinful flesh, tempted in all points. So he becomes the perfect mediator. So you, you can't just go talking to God. Now that's evident in Acts chapter 10. Cornelius prayed to God. He wasn't praying to a man. He was praying to God. He's the entity God. God says, well, look, Cornelius is praying, and he's a devout man and everything else. Of course, he can't see me, so I better p go get Peter to tell him. Go get Peter to tell him all what he must do to inherit eternal life. So we know how that goes. Jesus says, no man comes to the Father but by me, except if you receive me, you receive him who sent me. If you reject me, you reject him who sent me. If you honor the Father, you have to honor the Son as you honor the Father, and so on. And then to the disciples and the apostles, he says, As the Father sent me, now so I send you. Once Jesus, as an individual man, becomes high priest and ascends to the right hand of the power on high, now it's the apostles that, that you have to submit to 
as Jesus Christ working through them. And it's not the apostles per se, but it's that Christ is going to be working through them. That's the flesh he's going to use now. Because him as an individual flesh body has been glorified. But now he pours out the Holy Ghost. Now the flesh that he uses is going to be the apostles, the disciples. And in Acts, the, you know, Peter and John go up and the, what was the lame man? Or I'm not sure what, what it was. I think it was the lame man. Anyway, they say, look on us. Peter or John and Peter, John. Peter and John. Look, look on us. Showing how the body of Christ is in the role of high priesthood when it is, um, when you are operating under the unction of the Holy Ghost. Because it's Jesus Christ performing the functions of high priesthood through the body of Christ. And we're not saying that happens in an individual. We're saying it happens in the body of Christ and it is ministered, the body of Christ is ministered to and brought to the perfection of that role through men that God sends and through the preaching of the word. All right, so the God of glory appeared to the father Abraham, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then you have Jacob. Jacob was left alone and there rustled a man with him, a man who was the man Melchizedek. Until the breaking of the day when he saw it prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint and he rustled with him. And he said, let me go. For the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thou name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. All right. Now, this is interesting type because we are wrestling with the Lord. We are striving with the Lord. Uh, the blessing of Levi that Moses said, Let thy Urim and thy Thummim be with the Holy One with whom thou didst strive at the waters of Meribah. Remember the Urim and the Thummim are in the breastplate of the high priest. And it has to do with judgment, the breastplate of judgment. Urim means um, lights and perfections. Or, yeah, and it means the oracular, getting theological here, okay? The oracular brilliancy. The oracular brilliancy in the high priest's breastplate. Oracular means of, of speech, of speaking. Right? If any man speak, let him speak as the oracle. oracle of God. So, as a man speaks under the anointing, he is an oracle. And he has oracular brilliancy. Illumination to the will of God and the purpose of God. And it is for the working out of judgment. So that we can be made perfect so that we can go on to become kings and priests so we can follow on to become a son of god i know the bible says beloved now are you the sons of god and that's that's the embrace of faith but we go on to perfection we go on to perfect stature fullness of stature sonship and somewhere in all this i'm going to relate and equate Sonship and priesthood. Okay, so there's a link here. Sonship, priesthood, perfection, and oath. And what I'm saying is, if you ever get to the full stature of priesthood and or sonship, it will come as a result of of an oath that God swears. And then when God swears, then you are forever a king, a priest, a son. If God ever swears to you. Okay, um, and I'm getting into a lot of things. I think you get the idea that uh, Melchizedek was a man. And when he met our fathers, the patriarchs, Abraham, Jacob, so on and so forth, he appeared as a man to men. And that is important because from the beginning, no man could receive anything from God unless it came from a man, a, a priesthood which was administered in the form of a man. But God kept, kept that consistent from the Old Testament right through to the New Testament. It's just in the Old Testament, it was Melchizedek, which is God's spirit 
formed and revealed as a man, but yet not a perfectly formed, fit high priest to bring us to perfection yet. Because he had not suffered in flesh. Right? Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ. Consider him as an apostle. And as an apostle, what did he do? He suffered. He learned obedience by the things he suffered. Right? The sufferings of Christ are in his apostleship. The tasting of death was in his apostleship. Then he was glorified to be made a high priest. Right? For the joy set before us, God's going to glorify us to be king and priest unto our God. Eternal king and priest. All right. And high priesthood and sonship, I'm going to uh, equate, make the same in the scripture here. All right. So I... Uh, and also on the fact that God, God from the beginning, right back in the book of Genesis, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Well, the image of God. The image of God is man. Jesus Christ, the beginning of the creation of God. First thing God did is he, he became a man, but not a man that could execute, like I say, or administer a, high, a perfect high priesthood to bring us to perfection, that had to become when Melchizedek, after the baptism of, of Jesus by John, heavens opened, the Spirit of God descended upon him in a bodily shape. That's Melchizedek going into Jesus. That is Jesus becoming born again, if you will, or Jesus receiving the Spirit like we have to receive the Spirit. So Melchizedek doesn't start and Melchizedek doesn't end. It's just the priesthood changed form because the, the priesthood in the Old Testament was Melchizedek as a man, but then Melchizedek went into Christ and then the priesthood changed. It's still all Jesus. Melchizedek is, Melchizedek is Jesus without the flesh and bone body. Jesus Christ is Melchizedek in him, and then going through all the experience of his life, to pay for sins, to suffer in the flesh, suffer temptation, making and perfecting the role of pre high priesthood so that when he ascends to heaven, he would be able to save to the uttermost them that come to God by him. Okay, now... Okay, returning from the king of slaughter. Okay, I read that. Without father and mother, consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. Verily, they that are of the sons of Levi, who received the office of a priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not countered from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. All right. For such a high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. I'm looking for a scripture, I think it's in the Psalms, as well as Hebrews. Um, I'll have to look for it. Anybody know where that scripture is in, in the Psalms about Melchizedek? Well, the Lord has sworn and will not repent. Yeah, the Lord has sworn and will not repent that thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And, yeah. So the importance of that is the Lord hath sworn. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Okay? Now, yeah, let's go down that angle now. Just hang on to that. The Lord has sworn and not repent. Because I'm going to talk about the swearing, the oath, the priesthood, and the sonship. Before that, I want to finish something here that I said about the Levites. Of Levi, Moses, the blessing of Moses on the, the uh, tribes of Israel. Of Levi, he said, Let thy Thummim and thy Urim 
be with thy holy one whom thou didst prove at Massa and whom, with whom thou didst strive at the waters of Meribah. Levites were the ministering priesthood, the, the Urim and the Thummim. Thummim and the Urim are what's in the high, the high priest's breastplate of judgment. As I said, the Urim is the anointing that brings gifts, that brings oracular or brilliancy, expounded brilliancy to the purpose of God. And Thummim means the emblem of complete truth. The emblem of complete truth. You cannot have truth established in your heart simply by words. You must have an experience to agree with and validate the words. And that is your personal experience where the word of God is written on the table of your heart. And so when, when we hear the word of God, our old man will always strive with God. So this is like Jacob rustling with the angel or rustling with the man. The Levites uh, strove at the waters of Meribah. The waters of Meribah were the waters of bitterness. They strove with God. And it's through the striving and the struggle and the affliction and God's judgments coming upon us as we either go astray or make the wrong decisions or exercise our own iniquity. It's through all of this striving that the emblem of complete truth gets written upon our heart. As we were saying all along, when we taste the consequences of things, that is the personal experience. That is where the Holy Ghost will take the Word of God with this fiery finger, the fire of God in our affliction and burn it on the tables of our hearts in the midst of our suffering. Right? I mean, the best time to reprove a little kid for, I don't know, what's a good example? Touching Not, the hot stove. Touching the hot stove is right after he touched it. The, the, the moment he touched it. The blisters, on the, the blisters fresh on the finger. See, I told you not to touch. See what happened? Do you feel the pain? And that's going to leave the lasting impression, the greatest impact. And that's how God does it. We're in our affliction, and that fiery finger of God starts emphasizing what the Word of God was trying to tell us. <clears throat> fiery finger of God, writing it on the table of our hearts. Then you have an experience that you suffered from, and the impact, the suffering enhances the impact of the experience, so it becomes an eternal thing written on the table of your heart. Now you have thum, and that's complete truth, not just spoken words, not just a witness of anointed preaching or something you read in the scriptures that in your mind you seem to have a somewhat of an agreement to, but you have a living experience that God has ordained. And in the midst of that experience, the Holy Ghost has been writing on the tables of your heart. Remember when once the long suffering of God waited, when the sons of God and all of that and were sometimes disobedient? The ark was preparing. While the ark was preparing and Well, Jesus went down and preached to the spirits in prison. Well, while we're imprisoned in our own will, in our own iniquity, in our own bondage, while we're striving with God, not doing His will, not convinced that we're doing anything wrong, striving with God, while we're doing all that, we're in our prison, we have Jesus, the Holy Ghost, preaching to us while we're in our prison. Trying to convince us of what we couldn't be convinced of before. There's an element of striving that's almost necessary for us to go through in order for that truth to be permanently branded in the depth of our hearts. And that's Thuman. That's the emblem of complete truth. So to Levi he says, Let thy Thuman and thy Urim be with the Holy One. Who is the Holy One? Jesus, the High Priest. With whom thou didst prove at Mer- and with whom thou didst strive at the waters of Meribah. Okay, so there's that element of striving by which we obtain the complete truth, the Urim and the Thummim. Urim, oracular brilliancy in the high priest's breastplate. And that's the gifts of the Holy Ghost and other administrations that come by the Holy Ghost through Jesus Christ, the high priest. The Thummim, perfections. Thummim means perfections. So taking what we've heard and revealed by the oracular brilliancy and bringing it to perfection by going through experiences. 
one of the epithets, objects in the high, pri- high priest's breastplate, as an emblem of complete truth. All right, so that you need all of that. And it can only be done through the high priesthood. Okay, now I was to finish something. Now, let's go on to what I was going to talk about, swearing and all of that stuff. Of course, there's, now I have it. Now I have found the psalm, psalm that I was looking for. Yeah. The, thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord hath sworn. The Lord hath sworn. The Lord hath sworn, swear, sworn, swear, remember that, and will not repent. Once the Lord swears, we talked about this before, once the Lord swears, it's done. It's finished. He will not repent. He will not go back and change his mind. We have two ways. All of us come to a crossroads where God swears to us. Every man, every created comes to a crossroads where God swears I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Well, line up a thousand apostles and ten million angels to pray and intercede for that person. God will not repent because he swore. You know, Abraham, when he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. Saying, blessing, I'll bless thee, multiplying, I will multiply thee. And so he swore by an oath. He swore by an oath. And that's what we have with Melchizedek and Jesus. The Lord has sworn and not will not repent concerning Jesus Christ. Firstly, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And guess what? That's not limited to just Jesus. That's the place we have to get to if we want to come to perfection. We must get to a place where God sees our perfection and he swears and he says... That is my son. Remember Jesus when he was baptized? This is my beloved son. When did, when, it was a declaration from God of sonship. He had gone through as a young man. He learned obedience by the things he suffered. He was all ready for the ministry. Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Son, son. Son, if God calls you a son, you cannot be called a son, and you cannot be called a priest unless God swears by an oath. That's what we're getting at. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Whether the forerunner for us is entered, Hebrews 6.20 says, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. It doesn't mean Melchizedek ceased to exist because he has no beginning and he has no end. It means Jesus' high priest is taking over where Melchizedek left off because now Melchizedek is in Jesus Christ. Melchizedek and Jesus are one. God was in Christ, Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. Do you have to be born again and receive the Holy Ghost? So did Jesus. He had to be baptized and he had to be filled with the Holy Ghost, Melchizedek. And then, of course, because remember, Jesus Christ created the worlds. He created it all. Well, that was Jesus Christ when he was Melchizedek. In other words, when he was in a form that did not have a body of flesh and bone and blood, whatever. That's why in John 17 he says, Father, glorify me now with the glory that I had with you before, before the worlds were. Father, glorify, glorify me with the glory that I had when I was Melchizedek. You know, when I had that... All right. Melchizedek. It is far more evident that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testified, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. 
For the law made nothing perfect, but you see, Melchizedek priesthood was made under the dispensation of law. I mean, there was promise there and everything else. But did the Melchizedek priesthood make anything perfect? It did not. So much so that even the people who suffered affliction, who were, who were destined to be saved and become sons of God, who suffered in the Old Testament, they went to Sheol, the waiting place, and Jesus had to go down and preach to those guys in prison after he fulfilled his time on earth. So Melchizedek couldn't make them perfect. The only one who could make them perfect is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But before Christ came in the flesh, Melchizedek was like a son of God. But he wasn't a, a truly a son of God who could relate to us. And yet he had many similarities. Another priesthood after the similitude of Melchizedek. You know, whereas Mel Melchizedek administered spiritual things and began to start to reveal in part little things about not a full revelation of Jesus Christ, mind you, but he appeared to men. He appeared to Jacob and all of that. All right. Now, law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did by the which we draw nigh unto God. And inasmuch is not without an oath, he was made priest. For those priests were made without an oath. He's talking about the flesh and blood Priests like Aaron the high priesthood and the Levite priesthood. Those priests, Aaron's priesthood and the Levitical priesthood. That was under the law. And those priests were made without oath. But this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus' priesthood was born witness by God, and God made a declaration about it, and God swore by it, and He swore by an oath, This is my beloved Son. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. He will not repent. It is eternally finished upon the declaration of God. So, God can swear in his wrath, you will not enter my rest. You can never change that. That is forever. So what do you think when God swore to Abraham? It's all, it's finished. Abraham's going to be blessed. That's all there is. Nobody can stop it. Because he swore by an oath. He can swear by no greater. He'll sw swear by himself. He'll confirm it by an oath. I will take an oath. This... <laughs> You know, that's why if you know God calls you a son, well then, you're sitting in a good place. Right? You're sitting in a good place. Alright. Aaron's priesthood and Levitical priesthood made without an oath. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. Now, the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek is an eternal priesthood. That's the essence of what it means after the order of Melchizedek. It is a spiritual priesthood. It is an eternal priesthood. It is a priesthood necessary to bring unto perfection. And Jesus was the first one to be made and brought unto perfection. The captain of our salvation was made perfect so that he could relate to us and our process of being made perfect. But there is an attainment. There is an attainment uh, as we pursue after God and work out our salvation that those who God knows, and they get to a place. You can get to that place where God will swear unto you. That's where you want to get to. And this we will do if God... Permits. All right. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost, them that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us, and who is holy, harmless, 
undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens. In another place, the Bible says, He is able to have compassion for them that are ignorant and out of the way. Oh, so you blew it? You're ignorant? You don't know what to do? You don't know where to turn? You don't know where to go? Maybe that's because of neglecting so great a salvation in the past, what have you, and you're out of the way, you slip, stumble, what have you. This high priesthood can understand all the infirmities of the flesh that brought you to that place, and yet he was without sin. So not only can he have compassion on how you were tempted, but he can also show you how to get out of the mess. Because he's, he went down to hell, and he grabbed the keys. He's going to give you the keys of knowledge to get out of your bondage, your mess. He's going to set you free in whom the Son sets free, or the high priest sets free. Remember, we're going to equate perfection, high priesthood, and sonship. That's what we're doing. So, he can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities, whereas Melchizedek could not be. That's the, probably the most important difference to us in our path to perfection between Melchizedek and Jesus. And again, they're not two different people. They're Jesus Christ in different forms, in different um, uh, degrees of per- perfect high priesthood, let's say. So Jesus is the only begotten son. Melchizedek was not only begotten son. He was like unto the Son of God. Jesus' priesthood was confirmed with an oath. The Hebrews goes on about that. The Melchizedek priesthood was not confirmed with an oath. The Melchizedek priesthood was just simply God, whatever, however you want to do this, morphing into a man, appearing to men as men, in this form that he decided to do that, to establish the fact, to foreshadow that it was his plan all along to... Uh, manifested himself to man as a man and all of that. I'm not going to get into the whole eternal purpose of God there. but um, So after the similitude of Melchizedek, it's similar in that it's eternal. And it's similar in that the high priesthood is going to administer the things of God, bread and wine. It's going to administer bread and wine. So... Melchizedek got himself a name change, didn't he? When Jacob uh, wrestled with the angel and it was all over, what did the angel say? Well, after your wrestling's all over with this man, he says, well, I'm going to give you another name. You're not, no longer going to be Jacob, you're going to be Israel. Well, when, we, when we're finished wrestling with the will of God and the Holy Ghost in our life and God brings us to perfection, we're going to have a name written on our forehead. We're going to have a new name written down. Behold, old things are passed away. All things become new. We're going to have a new name. All right. So, priesthood and sonship are equal and they go together and they are confirmed by an oath as we read in the Psalms and the Hebrews. The oath is the final seal. The swearing and the oath are the final seal of God sealing your election. It's the final seal of your election. Because when God swears, it cannot be disannulled. I usually say this when I talk about God swearing. Okay, God can cast something stirring up in his mind or stirring up within himself a desire. Someone can be walking contrary, a king of Israel, a saint of God, whatever, a nation, whatever you want to say. And God will raise up a man of God and say, Thus saith the, the Lord, because thou hast uh, and despised my statutes and everything, I will surely bring this upon you and you shall destroy your city. And, and God will pronounce all this stuff. Well, that's not God swearing yet. That's God sending a prophet to say, here's what's stirring up within me, God says. This is, this is what's stirring up within me. And the people, maybe they fear God and they repent. And God says, okay, well, they have repented. Then I will also repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. So I'm making a distinction between God thinking something, having thoughts stirring up in his mind, 
uh, you know, a motion of wrath that has begun within him and sending a prophet to warn about that motion before that motion within God actually becomes spoken and declared. Right? Because once something comes out of the mouth of God, can, you, can he take it back? No, he can't. <laughs> he speaks and it is. And it stands fast. So, when God says, by an oath, I swear, that means something that came out of his mouth, and that is eternal and never can be changed. Whether it's unto damnation, I swear you will not enter into my rest, or whether it's the Lord has sworn and will not repent, you are a son of God. You will be a partaker of the role of high priesthoods. The people of God who go on to perfection, they will be kings and priests unto their God. And they are kings and priests by the declaration of God as he swears by an oath because you have come to perfection. You have endured. You have endured the tribulation, the hardship, the learning obedience by the things you suffered. You have embraced perfection. You have set your affection on the purity and the holiness of God being manifested. Jesus Christ is the only way to God and the only glory of God you see. And you, you have set to your seal. You have, your heart has been fixed. You want to see the glory of God more than anything. And all the pleasures of this world grow dim. They don't have nothing in comparison. The more you go on to perfection, the more spiritually minded you get, the more you set your affection on things above, the more you let God minister to you, the more you commune with Jesus Christ with everything that's in your heart, like the Queen of Sheba communed with Solomon until you realize in this life there's no motivation or spirit to pursue anything in this life. I'm dead to it. I saw Jesus. Nothing can compare how can I match that? How can I match that glory? How can I match that fulfillment? How can I match that satisfaction? How can I match that pleasure in His presence forevermore? How can I even come close? I'm dead. I commune with Solomon, all that's in my heart, like I'm the Queen of Sheba. I am a saint, and the Queen of Sheba, and the Solomon is like Jesus. I commune with all that's in my heart. And Solomon tells me, or Jesus tells me, everything answers all my questions. And I come to gradually realize the vanity of everything. Well, this is, this is what characterizes a person who's becoming saved. You don't want that stuff, that cheap pleasure anymore. It becomes meaningless. And you are, if your heart is fixed, if you're set, and you get to that point, God swears, makes a declaration, you are my son. You are kings and priests. Unto God. For ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. How can we administer anything spiritual to one another unless we are a part of the functioning high priesthood? Because you can't receive anything spiritual from God unless it comes through the high priesthood. And you can't say that's just Jesus in heaven. Because the high priesthood is, is Joshua the high priest clothed in his filthy garment. It's Jesus in heaven plus the work he's doing manifesting through all the body of Christ. Solemn and swear. Swear to make a solemn declaration invoking a deity, invoking a sacred person or thing or deity. Now God could not invoke a deity greater than himself so he swore by himself, right? And he could swear by no greater. It's a confirmation of and a witness to the honesty and truth and unchangeableness of such a declaration. I swear. It, it is a determined, I am not going back from this. See, to emphasize it. The Lord swear and will not repent. It's finished. It's a done thing. Solemn, deeply earnest and serious, sober, somberly, Grave, impressive, performed with all full ceremony, invoking the force of religion, sacred, somber, with utmost seriousness and gravity. And God solemnly, God solemnly swearing. I don't think I said a scripture with that word in it, but. Okay. Now, 
Um, there's something I was going to say and it slipped out of my mind. <clears throat> Just give me a minute. Just to be sure. Uh, oh, well, I'll throw this in. You know, be careful how when you get into theology and everything, but you, you've heard of the uh, word theophany. Theophany, In theological terms, a theophany is a manifestation or appear, a, appearance of God uh, to a man as a man. It's God's, and I, I'm saying here, it's God's spirit taking the form of a man, but not the likeness of sinful flesh. But a theophany was Melchizedek, because he was a man appearing to man, uh, theos, Theophany, Theo or Theos means God, and I don't know if Theophany means, but it's it's of of God anyway. All right, yeah. Okay. Um, Consider how great a man this was. That doesn't mean Melchizedek ceases to be, exist. It just means the form of his priesthood ceased to exist and took a new form when he became one with Jesus Christ's physical body, which was glorified. See, So Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but him that said unto him, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again the Lord swore and will not repent, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. We talked about Levites and striving and that. All right. Now, um, yeah. Hebrews 5. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men and things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. Sins. So there has to be a high priest that God takes from among men for man. So that that high priest can offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. Now, um, who can have compassion on the ignorant and them that are out of the way, for that he himself is also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. And no man takes this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. He's talking about the Old Testament high priesthood. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. And also he says in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So you see, perfection, sonship, and priesthood all go are all the same thing. Oh. Uh, Let's go on to perfection and Abraham. We have such a high priest became us. So now of the things we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. So Jesus Christ can, is a sacrifice for our sin. When we sin, he already offered himself as a sacrifice. For our sin, and he also offers gifts. He, you know, he descended first, and he led captivity captive. Then he ascended on high and gave gifts to men. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's all going through the high priesthood. And that's why us, as Joshua, clothed in filthy garments, the head of the of the role of high priesthood, Jesus, is going to give gifts. He's going to administer the um, he's going to administer the things of priesthood, the things that pertain to sacrifices for our sins and gifts and bring us to perfection. He's going to administer it through the body of Christ. Okay? For if he were on earth, for every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices whereof it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. Now, Jesus, when he was on earth, he was in preparation to become the high priest. 
was, was is, if there if he was on if he's on earth he should not be a priest seeing there are priests that offering gifts according to the law Aaron's priesthood Levite's priesthood okay, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly heavenly things as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for see saith he that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount but now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises okay and Hebrews 9 talks about the first covenant had an ordinances of divine service a worldly sanctuary a tabernacle and it talks about the candlestick and the table and the showbread and all of that. Now, uh, and in those days, when that was ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of his people. Now, Aaron, as a high priest, he was in the infirmity of a sinful flesh, so he had to offer for himself and the sins of the people. The Holy Ghost signifying that the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was standing. But now we have access into the holiest of holies by Jesus Christ. So having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, see it's through the flesh, through the body of Christ, that you have access into the holiness and purity and power and glory of God. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Well, I blew it. I'm, I didn't know what I was doing and I blew it. Yeah, I'm ignorant. Well, you know, I made a mistake and I fell to a sin. I'm out of the way. Well, he can have compassion on the ignorance and them that are out of the way, seeing he himself compassed with infirmity. And you must believe, you must believe that Jesus does know. Jesus does understand. Jesus does comprehend. Jesus does care. Jesus is for you. Jesus is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Jesus is concerned. He, he cares. And he is able to save to the uttermost. So, let's draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Which hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, if you want to consider how great a man this was, Melchizedek, then let's consider how greater a man Jesus Christ is, so that we can draw near with a true heart, a heart that is embracing perfection, not trying to exploit or exploit the grace of God or you know, fail the grace of God or, or uh, do, despite the, do despite the spirit of grace or whatever. People who are actually embracing perfection, let's draw an eye with a true heart. Let's draw an eye with full assurance of faith. Jesus has entered. He is the forerunner. And I believe this, he is the only one in the presence of God. Right? Because, remember he said, don't touch me, I haven't descended yet to the Father. Jesus Christ, can flesh and blood inherit the kingdom of God? No, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Same with Jesus. He had to be given a new glorified body. Then he went into the presence of God, Jesus, the firstborn from the dead, Jesus Christ, first one to enter into the presence of God. Now, nobody that I know of has resurrected and has a glorified body. Now, you might throw Elijah or Enoch or whatever. Let's visit that issue another time. <laughs> I'm not sure where all that works. But I'm saying in general, at least in general, there's nobody that has a been resurrected because when Jesus comes the second time that is when the dead in Christ shall rise we which are alive and remain shall be changed 
will be changed into a glorified body, it will be cut up together to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. You cannot go into the presence of God without a glorified body. So how can you be, you know, functional in the presence of God without a glorified body? Jesus was the first one. I was talking to Christopher about this the other day. Paul said, uh, you know, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body or, I, or out of the body, I cannot tell God No, Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I just said sort of, well, after all of this stuff that I teach about Melchizedek and glorification and everything else, it, it would have to be out of the body. Because how could his flesh and blood body be caught up in the pure of God in the third heaven? He must have been out of the body. It had to be you know, a vision of some sort. This, this this flesh and blood wouldn't 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 last a, a nanosecond in the presence of God. It would burn up. I'm sure. It would just fizzle out. Couldn't take it. Couldn't take the presence of God. We need to see it through the veil, through Jesus Christ. That's why no man has seen God at any time. No man can see me. He said, and live. All right. Well, I feel like there's something I want to say. Oh, that that's what I yeah. Well, I said that already. We're the royal generation. We are kings and priests unto our God. Okay, that's a good place to stop.